Thank you. That was fun. I'm not doing anything like that. Sorry. No balls. <laughs> um, it, it's truly an honor to be here today. What are there balls? No. Okay. Um, it's really an honor to be here today. I know this because every doggone person I know on campus has stopped me to tell me. Um, and I'm really glad that I'm speaking before President Stinger so that you all have to stay and listen to me to hear him. Um, it's also appropriate that I speak to you today because March is Women's History Month. It's also inappropriate that I speak to you today because I hate Women's History Month. Um, Women's History Month reminds me of how little impact women's history scholarship has had on popular understandings of women's history. With few exceptions, Women's History Month celebrates a version, a type of women's history that I see as the least transformative thing that women's history scholarship has accomplished. What Women's History Month tends to celebrate is great women, defined as women who accomplish things that men have long considered important, or defined as women who have been married to great men. Um, suffragists and first ladies are big favorites, so if you look at the History Channel's lineup of offerings for Women's History Month, you'll see this. And I have to say that from my perspective, this is a great improvement over regular History Channel offerings, which more, look more like this. <laughs> like, what is that? <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Um, the paltry impact of women's history scholarship on popular understandings of history is also evident at our local Barnes & Noble. I took these pictures just a few days ago. And if you go to the US history section, you'll find a section that looks like it probably should be called US presidents and other great men with two books about first ladies. And there they are, I've identified them for you. If you want to find books on other women in history, you have to walk through the World War II and military history aisles to the cultural studies section. And there you will find two books on women's history written by journalists, not women's history scholars. Um, this is distressing to someone who devotes her life to women's history scholarship. Now, one women's history scholar, a pioneer in the field, Laurel Thatcher Ulrich, has actually made quite a splash in popular culture. A quote from one of her articles, well-behaved women seldom make history, has gone viral. Ulrich wrote this because she wanted to convey her frustration that pious women in the colonial period that she studied didn't show up in history books. So she thought that well-behaved women should be in history books. Her point was that women who followed the rules remained people and weren't considered historically significant. Her phrase became a sensation only after it was picked up by a journalist who wrote a popular account of American women's history. And since then, it has shown up practically everywhere, on t-shirts worn by women, t-shirts worn by men, onesies for infants, t-shirts for pooches, domestic items, including needlepoint projects, aprons, um, tea towels, necklaces, totes, and the ubiquitous coffee mug. I learned while preparing this talk that if you really want to commit to expressing this sentiment, you can hire a tattoo artist, and you can wear it anywhere on your body. Ulrich's slogan has taken on a life of its own. Use less to champion the historical significance of well-behaved women, as she originally intended, than to celebrate activities traditionally associated with female misbehavior, especially of the sexual variety. So you can find the phrase on ready to purchase thong underwear, seductive pinup posters, and in addition, I think more evidence that this slogan is associated with female sexuality is it is often misattributed to Marilyn Monroe. 
Who knew? Okay, what does Ulrich make of all this? Well, she's amused, as you can see um, in this picture where she is surrounded by tchotchkes um, that bear the slogan. I think she must be disappointed, though, that her call to take ordinary and well-behaved women seriously has exercised so little influence over popular understandings of history. Now, that's me. At the tender age of 18, I was poised to become a well-behaved woman. I grew up in a home committed to fundamentalist Christianity. That's my church, Church Christ, Argentine, Kansas, 1970s. What that meant was that I was supposed to marry a good Christian man, take his name, bear his children, name them for him, clean his house, cook his meals, launder his clothes, and recognize that he was the head of my home. Now my husband is probably wondering where that wonderful prospective wife went. <laughs> I also learned as a child that women and men are fundamentally different. Men are more logical. Men are more sexual. Men are better suited for earning a living. Uh, men are better at making important decisions, and they are so good at running things from states to churches, offices to schools, and production plants to families. Now, I did not like the state of affairs one bit, but I had grown up being assured that this was the natural timeless order of things. The fundamentalist Christian church I grew up in was nothing if not a historical. At Kansas State in 1986, I took my first women's history course and it changed my life. Women's history showed me that assumptions about gender roles and gender differences have changed so dramatically over time that much of what I had been taught was natural and timeless was not only neither natural nor timeless, but not at all true. For example, I learned that in the 17th century American colonies, many people thought women, in fact, had as great a capacity for sexual desire as men, and maybe even greater, and that's partly why men worked so hard to control their sexuality. This made a lot more sense to my hormonally charged 18-year-old self than what I had been told about women's sexuality, which the, was that it barely existed. I learned that while housework has indeed been the domain of women for centuries, what that meant, what housework meant, was fundamentally different before industrialization changed everything. So pre-industrial households were miniature factories where women created food and fabric and other items that were essential for the survival of their families, their communities, their local economies, and the new nation they hoped to create. The idea then that women should devote their lives to raising children and doing the sort of housework that we associate with that term today is relatively recent. I learned that Victorian parents dressed their little girls and boys identically in dresses. They often cut their girls' hair short. They often let their boys' hair grow long. The fact that they weren't concerned about inculcating gender differences in their children highlighted for me how obsessed we are with them. Sticking bows on bald little girls' heads, making sure that baby boys have blue on and the girls are wearing pink. We want to make sure everybody knows what they are and that they grow up to be what we think they should. Um, after studying this history, I started thinking that perhaps we're not at all sure that boys and girls are naturally really all that different after all. I also learned that during wars, work that had been considered appropriate or inappropriate for women suddenly became more than appropriate for women. Men's work became women's work, and gender differences started to look very situational to me. Now, my childhood may have been unusually conservative in the 1970s, but with no history of my own, I joined legions of women before me, after me, who had, in the words of one women's history pioneer, 
with no women's history, internalized the idea of their own victimization, passivity, and inferiority to men. And I was not alone in being taught that certain characteristics and roles are natural for women and others are for men. And I was far from alone in growing up with little sense of history. If our national report card is to be believed, most students in this country are rather ignorant of history. 13% of seniors fail to demonstrate proficiency in US history a score that's extraordinarily low and lower than scores from previous years. But when you look at what these kids are being tested on, it looks a lot like Barnes and Noble's history bookshelves. What right was Maryland among the first colonies to grant? Anybody know? Religion. For whom? Well, they, they, they they granted freedom of religion to lots of people, but I tell you who they didn't grant freedom of religion to. Or their slaves. Or women. But the right answer is religion. And that's how you have to answer that question. Why was Shays' Rebellion important? What was the proclamation line of 1763? What was the central idea behind George Washington's foreign policy? Why were farmers interested in barbed wire? And which occupational groups were most likely to support Thomas Jefferson's Democratic Republican Party? Well, I would bet that for a lot of students, this stuff seems irrelevant, sometimes wrong, and definitely boring. Maybe especially for female students. And if one thing is true of my women's history courses, a growing number of which are populated by male students, if my students in those classes are telling me the truth, women's history is not boring. Last year, after I taught my um, modern US women's history course, anonymous evaluations from students had this to say, women's history is much more fun and interesting than I thought a history class could be, never boring. It gets kind of boring to read these because they say the same thing. Really got me interested in history, which I wasn't highly interested in before. It's the only history class I have looked forward to. I don't think there was one class where I was bored. History is my least favorite subject, but I thoroughly enjoyed this class. I love that we talk about how history affects today. History's not my best subject, so when I signed up for this class, I was somewhat hesitant, but it was fun, fun, getting to know my history as a woman. These are standard comments in a women's history course. So I've learned that one of the things that, that, that is so important about women's history is that it inspires students' interest in history. It helps them see how history matters, how it's relevant. Now, our country's policymakers and opinion leaders are constantly telling us how important it is that students understand history, and they're constantly decrying students' ignorance about American history. Indeed, since George Bush's No Child Left Behind initiative in 2011, the federal government has invested millions of dollars in teaching American history grants and other programs designed to increase students' knowledge of U.S. history, very carefully characterized as traditional U.S. history, and I think we know what that means. Barnes and Noble, yeah. Um, now, I'm quite sure that what I'm about to suggest is not at all what President Bush had in mind. But our nation's leaders might want to consider how women's history and more generally, history that students see as relevant to their lives inspires their interest and enhances their learning. Women's history shows us how normal people, people just like us who simply lived in a different time, shows us how they thought about and experienced their lives in ways that are different than the way that we think about and experience our lives. It shows us human possibilities that get closed down when we assume that the way things are now is natural, timeless, and unchangeable. It shows us, well, my last slide is not there, and it was such a good one. <laughs> okay, it shows us that we, each and every one of us, are products of history, but we're also agents of history, whether we're first ladies, movement leaders, homemakers, waitresses, factory workers, 
teachers, or students. We're all making history every day, the well-behaved and the less well-behaved among us. I believe that women's history can change the world. I know it changed mine. <laughs>